Welcome to Let's Chat About, the free monthly webinar series hosted by Sophia C's Hope. We've developed the series with those living with Leber congenital amaurosis and inherited retinal diseases in mind, but it is open to anyone who's interested in what's happening in our communities. My name is Alyssa Bass, and I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications for Sophia C's Hope. Before we get started, I wanna take a moment to thank our sponsors for this series. AGTC, Dominion Energy, Janssen, Mira GTX, Procure, and Spark Therapeutics. We could not provide programs such as these without their support. This session will last about 45 minutes. We will take questions at the end. You can submit questions through the Q&A function. And we are recording this session. So after the webinar, we will post the recording to our YouTube channel and send you the link for your reference. We will also post it on our social media. It's my pleasure today to welcome Todd Durham, Vice President of Clinical and Outcomes Research for the Foundation Fighting Blindness. Foundation Fighting Blindness is a national nonprofit that funds research to treat and cure inherited retinal diseases. In his current role, Todd is responsible for directing the Foundation's Consortium of Retinal Experts, developing strategies to enhance product development, partnering with industry, and providing technical input on partnered programs and investment decisions. Todd has more than 25 years of drug development experience. Prior to his current position, he contributed to research on numerous marketed products as Director of Biostatistics with IQVIA's Real World Evidence Solutions. He was a doctoral fellow with Bristol Myers Squibb, and he worked in various statistical and leadership roles for Novan, Inspire Pharmaceuticals, Quintiles, and as a self-employed consultant. Todd earned a BSPH, an MS in biostatistics and a PhD in health policy and management, decision science and outcomes research from the UNC Gillings School of Global Public Health. Welcome, Todd. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, first, talk to us about what's happening at FFB these days. What are your biggest projects and what's on the horizon for the organization? Well, we're entering our vision walk season um, in the late spring. So we're working on fundraisers. So that's uh, one activity that our colleagues are working on. Um, in my particular area on the clinical research side, we've just announced that we're initiating a new natural history study um, in Usher syndrome type 1F. Um, this is associated with the uh, gene PCDH15. And this is like uh, very similar to some of the other studies that we've done through our network of um, inherited retinal disease specialists, where the objective is really to understand the progression of uh, this condition over time. So it's a four-year follow-up period. And what we're hoping to do is identify ways to measure the progression of disease that um, are sensitive to change. That means it looks like they change over time in a short amount of time. Um, we're looking to see if there are factors that can predict that rate of progression. And, um, and this is um, to, to look at visual function, but, but also anatomical features of the retina using OCT. And one of the um, main purposes of a study like this is to help design clinical trials. So when you're developing a new therapy, um, say for Usher type 1F one day, um, you want to know how long does a clinical trial need to be to show that there's a benefit for this, this treatment. So um, as patients and people who um, research who, who care about affected individuals, we are hoping to accelerate that research process. So you want to make sure the design is well targeted and is um, not too onerous and too burdensome. Um, so the, the idea is if we can identify a way to measure the progression of the disease in the absence of a treatment, we can decide whether the follow-up period after administering that treatment should be two years, would one year suffice, and how do we, what, ex what tools do we use to measure the progression of disease that'll help us judge the efficacy of that new treatment. So that's a, one big project that we've been working on, and these natural history studies can take up to nine months to a year to get off the ground once we have an idea to do them. They're major undertakings. So it is a big deal that we're launching a new one of these uh, this month. So that's one project and um, a couple more. Um, we are also in the beginning of a new project uh, in uh, studying um, males who have X-linked retinitis pigmentosa. Um, this is a condition that's associated or caused by the 
mutations in the RPGR gene. And we're working with two industry um, representatives, two companies who are developing therapies. Um, and we're in the beginning planning stages of this research project. And the goal is really to understand what is it like um, to live with X-linked RP. So we're going to be surveying folks with the XLRP through our registry. And then we're going to be convening a panel of experts um, and we will be inviting the FDA to attend um, a workshop where we really present the results of this work and also invite affected individuals and their caregivers to tell us what life is like with XLRP. And the idea is you really want um, regulatory bodies to really understand what's at stake when they're reviewing uh, their applications for new products. Um, so they really want to understand uh, what risks individuals are willing to tolerate for the benefits, and they really want to understand um, what is the impact on uh, daily living. So many of these clinical trials are going to use very carefully collected data on visual function, for example. Um, that's not the only thing that matters to someone who has XLRP or LCA. There are your um, changes in your vision impact your life in many, myriad ways. So we want to understand all the ways that vision impacts your life. So this is an interesting project, and I hope we um, hope we can do more of this project. I think that it's a collaboration between the foundation and industry is a really strong point for this research. And the third one I'll mention uh, today, amongst amongst many others, is um, we have um, we're working on our registry, which I'll tell you a little bit more about. But we've just launched our first um, user experience survey. We're really giving um, serious consideration for how we um, how we improve our registry experience, um, and then what are the ways that we can help make it more valuable to both the members of the registry and uh, researchers, research community. So we've just launched that survey within the last two to three weeks, and beginning to examine the results from that. So those are three sort of major initiatives at the moment. Is that user experience survey, is that still, can people still participate in that? They can. So if they are registered uh, as a member of My Retina Tracker, they can still participate. It should be show up at the top of the uh, surveys to complete when they log in. So that's very interesting. I'm, I'm, I'll be interested to see what the results of that are. Yeah, we're already learning a lot. And um, I really, um, don't well, I, I would like to emphasize that we, you know, we sort of view this as a key input. Um, we, the, the individuals who are in our registry are key constituents for this particular program. So we want to make sure we're listening and um, acting on those suggestions and the feedback as, as much as we can. Um, we've already gotten some great suggestions, which I can talk about a little bit later in our conversation, but um, it's, it's been a, bit, a very valuable experience. And I think um, for me, it's uh, it, we're in a rapidly evolving research field. Um, we've got new therapies coming all the time. To me, it's important to put in mechanisms where we can learn along the way. Um, and I think this is true in other aspects of business. We, we want to get as many early indicators as possible that maybe we need to maybe have a course, a course adjustment, you know, that maybe there, a new direction is warranted. Um, rather than looking back, you know, on the past year or two and realizing we were off off target. So to me, this is a key part of, of how we're we going to make this registry more valuable to all of us going forward. And um, we can't we can't know. We sometimes we can guess as to things we ought to be doing. But the best input is going to come from folks who are interacting with the registry and interacting with us. It also helps um, direct resources and prioritize exactly how we spend the time on the registry. So it's a fluid, it's like a living, breathing thing as opposed to just a static um, document. Yeah, I view this as a, um, I think the survey will probably close at the end of June, um, but we're going to bring this survey back every couple of years to make sure we're we are collecting data in real time, but I think this is an important mechanism. Um, otherwise, we rely on um, emails, questions, um, problems uh, to sort of infer the direction we ought to go. But as much as possible, we really want folks' feedback. And in this survey, we ask about their experience, not just with the, the registry itself, but also with our genetic testing program, which many people have 
been able to take advantage of. So this is a great segue because our topic today is patient registries. So talk to us about what a patient registry is and why patient registries are important to a rare disease community. Yeah, a patient registry is, um, is really a, a collection of data. Um, it's a planned collection of data, so it's not haphazard. So you have intended to collect certain data either about a, um, around a condition or disease, or you, um, many times you will see registries um, that are established to follow individuals who've taken a certain treatment. Um, I often see that in the pharmaceutical world. Uh, let's say you're concerned about a, a rare but serious um, adverse effect of a treatment. Many manufacturers will establish their own registry so they can collect that information prospectively and follow up as they need to. And that's part of the, the research cycle and ensuring that they have uh, safe and effective products on the market. In our case, uh, our registry is focused on individuals who have inherited retinal degenerations or diseases. And the purpose and the other thing that distinguishes a registry from other forms of data collection is it has an intended research purpose. Um, in our case, the research purpose is to understand genetics, um, uh, prevalence of conditions, uh, to understand the impacts of the IRDs on individuals' lives. Um, and then the second purpose is to enable researchers to find individuals for their research studies. So those two are the main purposes of our registry. Um, there are other registries with other um, foundations uh, like the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Cystic Fibrosis Foundation has a wonderful registry. Uh, they use their registry for other things. They have a lot of clinical data from their specialists. Um, they use the registry not just for research, um, but they're also using it for um, quality improvement. So if, if um, you're uh, someone who has cystic fibrosis, it's often recommended to take certain medications on a regular basis or under certain circumstances. So um, the CF Foundation will use their registry for multitude of purposes. And every time you have a new purpose in mind for the registry, you have to think about what kind of data is required. You also have to think about what kind of resources, you know, people and skills do you need to carry out those, those purposes. So we're, we are also giving thought as to, you know, directions for our registry as we move forward. Each one of those new uses requires a new set of data, new set of resources. So we have to say, you know, how do we prioritize what our, our next um, application is for the registry? So Foundation Fighting Blindness has a registry called My Retina Tracker. Um, give us the history of that. When did the foundation launch that registry and why did it do it back at the time that it was started? And then how has it evolved since then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, uh, this registry has been around for a long time. It started out many, many years ago as a mailing list. Um, just probably was being tracked in Excel or something like that. And it really before, was. Before the uh, internet was invented. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> um, an online version of this has been around for, I think, something like eight or nine years, uh, maybe even longer. Um, and uh, it, I think when it went online, then we had a, a whole series of, we call them survey modules, um, where we we're collecting data in certain domains, like there's a a domain about what assistive devices do, do folks use, a uh, section on driving, um, section on uh, vi visual symptoms. Um, and we've just recently added this, this last year um, on, the, on the platform, it shows up as My Health Today. And these, this is a series of um, questions that have been developed by the NIH to really assess um, physical and mental health. Um, so we capture that information as well. So the, um, it was what became, was a mailing list went on online platform uh, in the last, um, last year, we, we moved from uh, one, one provider and platform to a, a newer one, which we think has some nicer, nicer and more contemporary features that allow us to, um, for example, when we contact our registry members, we would like to know for those members who received what notification. So it has some of that, 
um, documentation about who's been contacted with which announcements would help us track that information. Um, of course, we, we also did the best we could to make sure it's accessible to folks who use screen reader technology. Uh, we wanna make sure it's usable. Um, and so this has been an evolution. Um, I would say every, every um, even with this most recent evolution, there are things that we know that we can improve and our operational team is still trying to find ways to optimize our experience and our administration of the program. Of course, it, it takes a while to get used to new technology and work streams and things like that. And we're, uh, I think we've, we've learned a lot in the last few months. Um, and I think uh, going forward, we would like to explore some more features of the platform. And we're certainly going to be using some of the input that we've received already from that user experience survey to figure out where to take this next. And who is this, who is my retina tracker for? Who should be searching it out and putting their information into it? It is open to anyone with an inherited retinal condition. Uh, if they are uh, an adult, they can register themselves. We also welcome the adult caregivers of children um, who have IRDs. That's our, our main target population. Uh, it's open globally to anyone. It's at the moment just in English. Um, so if uh, folks can access the internet, um, then we encourage them to register. And you know, one of the purposes that we, um, we have the, the registry for is to help individuals find research opportunities they may qualify for. So the more complete is the profile, the more we know, um, the more likely one is to be contacted about a research opportunity. Because many of our um, research collaborators may approach us with a research idea and uh, with certain criteria they want to apply for their study. And we use as much data in the profile as we can to help find the right, right target for that study. And it can be particularly challenging in a rare disease community to find enough people, enough Absolutely. Just individuals for a clinical trial. I know that um, you know, if, you're, if your pool is very, very small to begin with and you need a certain percentage, then that can be a challenge. Absolutely, we, we work with um, work with ophthalmologists and academic and other and other contexts all the time, and they'll say, "Well, I have a fairly large clinic, but I'd like to survey 200 or 400 people for this research study." So they don't have access to 200. They have, you know, of course, their own patient database, but they don't have access to 200. So this is really the value to the community at large is we can pool our resources, and this can be the central location to come and help identify um, individuals who, who can participate in these studies. A registry like my retina tracker needs um, people to be proactive though, right? Like your information is not, just because you go to see an ophthalmologist and he gives you, he or she gives you a diagnosis of an inherited retinal condition, you are not automatically added to any registry. You have to go and do it yourself. That's correct, that's correct. So we. We encourage folks to sign up. Um, we also encourage folks to visit their profile at least once per year and update their information. Um, one of the key activities and key priorities for us going forward is to make sure that we keep our membership engaged um, so that we can keep them, uh, keep in touch with them. We know that folks move, we know they change jobs, their email addresses change. So we, we want to make sure folks don't forget about us so they keep their profiles up to date. Um, that will make sure that we can contact them. There may be a clinical trial next year that they may be eligible for. We wouldn't want them to miss out on an opportunity to hear about that. So what are some of the research projects that the registry has been involved in? Yeah, this is, um, it's, it is amazing to me since I became involved with the registry, how often it is used. Um, on any, in any given month, we're probably talking with six or seven researchers of who would like to have access to the registry. And, um, and the way this, this typically works is uh, they contact us and, and we make the introduction to our members. Once, once we've identified good candidates, we, make, we uh, introduce our members to research opportunities with a letter. And we will, have, we will have discussed with the researcher what their study is all about. If it's an interventional study like a clinical trial, we make sure that their letter that they send out, that we send out on their behalf has been approved by their IRB to make sure it's appropriate research study. Um, we make sure the studies are legitimate uh, research undertaking and not marketing um, material. 
Um, so we make those introductions, but um, uh, some of the studies that, that come to mind that I think are interesting, last year we, we partnered with Retin International and Fighting Blindness Canada on a cost of illness study. And the purpose of this study was really to, for lack of a better word, put a dollar amount on how much do, do the IRDs cost the US. Um, so this is called the, the economic burden on the, the country as a whole. And um, so we participated in that partnership by recruiting for a survey, which Retin International um, commissioned. And we recruited for the survey here in the US through our registry membership. So we had an outstanding response to that survey. And those, those data that we were able to, to um, get through that survey go directly into the analysis um, to estimate the cost of illness of the IRD. So that when you see the paper about what's the estimated um, cost uh, to the U.S. of the IRDs, um, that study, that study result came because people participated in my retina tracker registry. Um, so I encourage folks to check out that paper. It's uh, available on Retina International's website, and we could provide you with a link later if, if folks are interested. Um, so that's one study, and that study I, I like to, to mention because that was one where we were able to essentially notify our entire membership that they were candidates to participate in this study. Um, so that we, not all of the research that we support is like that. Many of the studies that we support are limited to a much smaller subset of our membership. Um, one that's, that's interesting, I think, is, and I, I can't name the researcher because I haven't asked for their permission, but there's an academic researcher who's interested in speaking with individuals who, who have lost most of their vision. So they are, um, have visual acuity of 2,200 or worse. Um, and this researcher is interested in what are expectations for folks who may be candidates for prosthetic devices, um, either now or in the future. Um, so I think that's a very interesting one. So that's, that's the case where we use the data that's in the profile, what our members tell us about their visual acuity, that information is used directly to identify them for a research study um, that we hope one day will lead to development, hopefully of a, a next generation prosthetic device. Um, a third study that, that comes to mind is a, is a totally different flavor altogether. And it's, um, it is a study proposed by um, a graduate student. And um, she is interested in what are the experiences uh, of individuals who have undergone genetic testing and counseling? So how did that counseling session um, change the way they view their life? Uh, what impact did it have on them? So this is, I think, a very um, promising and interesting research. And we saw this, we thought this is very relevant for our, for our members and for our, um, our community at, in general, because we, we believe that genetic testing and counseling is just hugely important. And from, from my conversations with individuals, that, that moment when you have the clarity of the genetic diagnosis is kind of a, a, a day that you remember, um, it is now the time where I can be thinking about, um, I can at least ask the questions. What, what do people like me? What is the, the typical progression for folks like me? Um, are there research opportunities for me? What are the research prospects for people like me? So I think this is, um, this is a, certainly a, a research study we we're happy to support. So those are three different kinds of studies. And, and over the years, we have helped uh, numerous companies recruit for their clinical trials too, which is also exciting. And um, I think all of these, re all of this research is, um, I think gonna make a big impact. I think it's important to note too, that because there are some scams out there, there, there is an element of risk uh, for the patient community when there are these solicitations for clinical trials or research studies or any kind of survey to know that organizations and researchers and, and pharma has been vetted by Foundation Fighting Blindness before the patient's even contacted. It provides a level of safety, I think, to the community that's important. Right, I agree. So what does the future hold for my retina tracker? Yeah, we're, um... I can tell you about some, some of my hopes and dreams about the registry. Uh, I've given you a few examples today about some studies that we've done. Um, one, of the, one of my goals going forward is to really highlight for our registry community and our members what research is being enabled 
because individuals have um, submitted their information about themselves um, for purposes of research. So we're, we're looking to ways to update our membership on studies that have been done through the registry. Um, we're looking, looking at ways to um, engage our membership uh, more regularly with um, information, hopefully that's more tailored towards um, their profile. So um, speaking with a number of individuals uh, involved with the foundation, they say it sure would be nice if, if when I tell you that my, my gene is, let's say EYS, that you could um, tell me more about people like me. So is there something I can learn from the registry about other people like me? So we're looking into some ways that we can um, collect, collect that data, put it in a way that's um, understandable, digestible, presentable, and um, make that available to our membership of the registry. So those two, two things, and also thinking about ways to engage and, and um, retain our members um, over a long period of time. We'd like to know how, how conditions change. This is one of the ways that we can inform our research partners. Um, we're, you know, as, you know, as your vision changes, or your life situation changes, we'd like to know, you know, what are the milestones along the way? That's informative information. Um, so I think for me that the key, the key focus right now is really um, delivering um, back to the members um, some information that they find useful, that they, that shows that they are contributing to science. And I'd also like to, um, we have plans to prepare either reports or peer reviewed publications out of the registry um, over the, the coming years so that we can really you know, show the research community, we can really learn a lot about what life is like with the inherited retinal diseases. How can organizations like Sophia Sees Hope help um, keep these registries like My Retina Tracker active uh, up to date, robust. What what can what can we do to uh, to assist here? Well, thank you for asking. I think um, it's always helpful to to remind individuals if they're if they're not a member to to please sign up and register. Um, also helpful to remind um, folks to to revisit the their account um, on an annual basis to make sure everything is up to date. Um, those two things are very useful. And um, also feedback. If you get feedback from your community, you know, I'm hoping to get this out of my retina tracker registry, but I don't see how I can get this information. Can you pass that information to the foundation? That would be super helpful. So we, we need, need not rely on individuals offering their own suggestions. Um, it's always helpful to have um, any input is super helpful. I mean, otherwise we're left wondering how, how do we direct our attention to uh, improve the experience. So any information, constructive feedback you receive from your community and, and others that you're connected with, that will be super helpful. Um, what's your, you've, you've had a long career in uh, retinal disease and, and rare and the rare community. Um, what's your sort of, what's your takeaway of this moment in time that we're in right now? Uh, in in the the rare disease community, and specifically speaking to um, LCA and and the other IRDs. Yeah, I I joined the Foundation Fighting Blindness. I think an exciting time, and um, I but before my time, you don't have to look you don't have to look very far back in the past, at a time when there was very little um, treatments in the pipeline. So you could go on clinicaltrials.gov maybe five or 10 years ago, and you wouldn't find a clinical trial. You wouldn't find very many there for the IRDs. So to me, that's exciting. Um, the, and, and we don't know. Um, it's, it, it's not, um, I don't think all these therapies will, the, will, will not be um, effective or efficacious. So not all the therapies are going to work out but most certainly will learn a lot in that process. And that is the nature of product development. So I think what's exciting is many of these, what had been thought to be impossible to treat conditions now have multiple therapeutic approaches for them. 
Um, so things like neuroprotection, if we can just slow down the further degeneration of the photoreceptors, that could be really helpful. That could add, you know, hopefully years to vision. Um, genetic therapy, uh, gene therapy has, you know, has the potential in many cases to restore vision that was lost. Um, and you have even new technologies, even for later stage disease, like the, the retinal prosthetics are it's a pretty amazing technology that's coming out. And to me, that this is an exciting time. And I, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say which should be a, a great time of hope because 10 years ago, there was not, not a whole lot of treatments to talk about. And now, even as the foundation stands, we struggle to keep up with all, all of the latest news amongst therapy developers. So I think that's exciting. Another thing that's exciting to me and I hope to contribute to is the engagement of affected individuals and their families in the process is, um, it is a, a, a national trend. Um, it's a, this effort towards engaging, we'll say patients and having patients as the center of research is something that the, the, FD, the US FDA has organized around this idea. And that's certainly something that the Foundation Fighting Blindness can enable. And so I think, you know, two ways that, that we're already contributing in, in our small way to that is we have organized and, and with Sophia C's hope, um, so Hope's help, um, we have organized workshops, uh, scientific workshops um, for CRB1 and IQCB1 and RDH12 before that. And these workshops really were um, scientifically centered but also included the voices and perspectives, perspectives of patients and their families. And to me, that's a unique thing that the foundation is doing, is really to make sure that we don't lose sight, that, that there are humans, there are people and lives that are impacted um, by this research, um, and make sure that we, we don't lose sight of that. And the second is this collaboration that I mentioned at the outset, where we're working with two companies um, in, in X-Linked RP. This is really a way where we can really study together um, what is the real impact of these conditions on, on folks' lives. And to me, those are two ways that we're sort of contributing to the overall effort towards patient-focused drug development. And I think those are, um, to me, those are exciting because uh, it brings the right people back to the research table, um, the folks who have most at stake here. Um, rather than being just research subjects, they participating in the research. So to me, that this is an exciting time because there are now formal mechanisms that where we recognize the value of input of affected um, individuals in the research process. It does seem to me to be the biggest change in even just in the last five years, mm -hmm. um, just the incorporation and the interest in the patient community, the patient voice and the patient perspective. So Todd, we appreciate your time so much today and we appreciate the Foundation Fighting Blindness and you are a wonderful partner to Sophia Sees Hope and, and uh, we really enjoy putting on programs with you guys and we love the support that you show us and um, thank you very, very much for your insights today. I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Alyssa. It's been my pleasure. All right, have a good day. Thank you.